Um, hello, and welcome to our talk. I'm Nick. This is Olivier and Kenneth, and we're from Uber. You may have heard of us. Um, personally, I'm pretty horrible at naming things, and that includes talk titles. So the title you see here is kind of what we went with. Um, this is my third year at Mac DevOps. Uh, this time I brought colleagues with me because it's my favorite conference of the year. Um, I really want to extend a big thanks to Matt and the team uh, for letting us talk. Um, we're here today to talk about a system we built to manage and distribute macOS virtual machines for the purposes of iOS development at Uber. Um, in terms of mobile CI systems, there's many like it, uh, but this one is ours. And we had the help of lots of other engineers to get where we are today. Uh, so with the intros out of the way, uh, we'll take a brief over look at a brief overview of our talk. Um, we'll give some background context on what continuous integration is and an introduction on how it's historically been accomplished at Uber, for better or for worse. Uh, next, I'm going to do a general overview of the components, architecture, and the tools we use through the management process. Uh, we have one specific component that we're really excited to share. It was built by both Olivier and Kenneth. It's codenamed Versailles. And Olivier is going to do a deep dive into the architecture, design, and functionality. And lastly, Kenneth is going to talk through some of the things that we learned, um, time we spent on interesting problems, and what you might run into if you attempt to implement something, uh, something like this. Um, so why are we talking about all this stuff? Uh, at Uber, mobile development is at the core of what we do. It's how our riders and drivers engage with our platform, and it's allowed us to scale our business to 75 countries and nearly 500 cities, um, 499 if you exclude Vancouver. Um, and it's only getting bigger. We'll share some of the hypergrowth challenges we've had and talk about why the size of our mobile development infrastructure is slightly unique. Uh, we also wanted to talk about this because the complexity of macOS and iOS development uh, infrastructure is, uh, it varies uh, across implementations at various companies. Uh, shops, large and small, struggle with doing this right for their developers and they don't often have the resources to make it world class. Um, and lastly, because we're using DevOps tooling and ideologies, the talk is particularly re relevant for this conference and for future audiences. Uh, a quick fun fact, uh, I launched this system last year from my hotel room here in Vancouver during Mac DevOps YVR, um, and beer was definitely involved. Uh, we'd like to also include a brief uh, references and shout out slide uh, here in the beginning for anyone that's getting started with the concept of CI. Um, there's some great content out there, and we hope that this talk helps to build on those concepts. Of note, many of you know Tim Sutton, uh, who gave a talk last year at Mac DevOps on using Jenkins for automation, and Elliot Weiser, uh, who talked earlier this year in February about the concepts of immutable architecture and creating Mac OS VMs during the uh, Utah Mac, Mac Managers Meetup. Um, this talk also builds on a previous talk we gave during Facebook's At Scale conference last August. Uh, we talked about supporting iOS development in Uber and how we had to scale that using a Facebook-built uh, Facebook tool called Buck. And uh, lastly, we'd like to give a brief shout out to Mac Stadium. I know a couple of the guys were here this week. Greg, Jason, and the rest of the team have been supporting the fairly ridiculous size of this deployment. And uh, the challenges we've had to some of the products they offer, they've met those with a really helpful, willing, and curious attitude. Um, so we appreciate their support and the opportunity to work with them. Um, to start, let's define continuous integration. Uh, Martin Fowler is a renowned software developer and champion of software development practices. Uh, he also happens to be the top result on Google. So he defines CI with the following definition uh, from above. Uh, a software development practice where members of a team integrate their work frequently. Usually each person integrates at least daily, uh, leading to multiple integrations per day. Uh, each integration is verified by an automated build, including a test uh, to detect integration issues as quickly as possible. So let's go over some of the core concept of CI, uh, because we want to make sure that the system we built and the overall infrastructure enables those. Um, in general, all CI systems should follow these concepts, among others. And these are not really unique to Uber. Uh, some of these might be familiar to you, like maintaining a code repository and source control, um, automatically building and testing your code, making sure there's regular commits, and being able to get good metrics and reporting uh, from the system. At Uber, these concepts translate into the above results. Uh, our iOS developers maintain their code base in a mono repo, which is a single repo for all iOS projects at Uber. Uh, we use Fabricator and Jenkins for end-to-end -end automation in the development workflow, and we enable regular commits to our code base with the speed of the tooling, and specifically for this talk with our infrastructure. And from the beginning, these core concepts were mostly baked into the development processes at Uber. 
But when I joined uh, exactly three years ago in mid-2014, uh, this was our CI setup. And we had t 12 total mobile developers. Uh, there's a Mac Mini that you can barely see down there on the bottom right. And it ran a post-land validation step. And the laptop on our left was the release box. Um, stop me if you've heard this before, but we couldn't release any of our apps unless a single human was there to press the buttons. Uh, this system surprisingly sustained us until late 2014 when a bunch of uh, crazy things happened. Our hiring numbers for mobile engineers exploded. We added a driver application for Android. A number of internal uh, applications were launched for our operations group. And lastly, like many system re-architecting situations, we had a major outage. So our answer was to start building clusters of Mac minis in our data center, and uh, bad selfies notwithstanding. This generally met our demand OK until 2015, when we dramatically scaled our development efforts due to hiring and global competition. And to go along with that build more Mac Minis general strategy, uh, we established infrastructure allocation strategies uh, as well. In the earlier growth phases, we previously decided on a strategy that allocated a specific pool of Mac Minis per function, uh, things like build, test, experimentation, maintenance, and signing. Um, and after trying several of these allocation strategies with the physical hardware, uh, we realized that the bulk of our work was happening during daily working hours which is not terribly unique and is pretty much expected. Um, but what we did understand, however, was that the majority of this development work was build execution. And so we just needed to adjust and make sure that every host could do every function and change uh, the time at which some of these things ran. Uh, to be honest, this slide doesn't really tell a story that's very significant or surprising. But having data about your systems is kind of the point that we want to make here. And you can see data there. So. Um, this slide tells a little more of a story with some of that data as well, especially when talking about the host allocation strategies. Uh, we mentioned earlier that size was fairly unique for us, and this slide demonstrates some of that. Um, over the past two years, we've essentially multiplied our commits per month by 10x, and you can see why we might want a more dynamic uh, underlying system to bear that load. Um, as we grew, we kept adding more Mac minis to handle the growth, and eventually all of our infrastructure was being occupied with developer submissions to the code base. Um, some of you might be familiar with the content on this slide. Uh, part of what contributed to a lot of that explosive growth you see on the last one uh, during late 2015 and 2016 was redevelopment of the driver application and also the rewrite of our rider app shown here, uh, which was codenamed Helix internally. And this slide also shows commits per year, almost 26,000 last year in 2016. So uh, suffice to say, Uber is doing a lot of iOS development. Um, so now that we've shared a bit of context, uh, we'll give an overview into the system we built and how it all works together. Um, there's many components to the CI system, but for this talk, we'll discuss those that surround our virtual infrastructure. Those components include macOS VMware VPC uh, and the VMs that run within uh, on Mac Stadium's uh, uh, hardware, uh, Versailles, which is our VM worker provisioner that's written in Go, and Jenkins, which is our main CI workflow orchestration tooling. Uh, developers submitting a code change trigger a Jenkins job, and some piece of infrastructure has to be available to execute the uh, ensuing workflow. Um, while our developers generally, our workflows generally start and end with Jenkins in this, in this manner, the virtual environments do the load of the work, so we'll kind of start on the far right here and talk about how we manage them. <coughs> uh, we started out building an ESX, ESXi environment that was a uh, much smaller scale than what we needed. This led us through testing for our workflows and allowed us to initially look at differences in the virtualization environment versus the physical. We had really high aspirations for a lot of the things we wanted to test in staging, but we ultimately decided that our work would have to live in the same environment as production. Uh, so we rebuilt it in Mac Stadium uh, while we were working on that as well. We initially launched our production environment with 35 Mac Pros, each one running ESXi and connecting to a single vCenter instance. Uh, the ESXi vCenter combo worked really well for us because we didn't have to maintain the resiliency of that. Mac Stadium took care of all of that for us as a service provider. We referenced the uh, iOS talk from the At Scale last year earlier, and uh, that talk gives a lot of context for what eventually became known to us as adventures in data store technology. Uh, because our Buck build tooling does heavy local writes and caching within uh, the virtual machine during compile jobs, each virtual machine clone was writing its build output to that shared storage layer that supported the entire uh, virtual environment. Uh, we had really mixed performance on different storage types. And Mac Stadium was generous enough with their resources uh, to basically throw them at the problem. 
Uh, so we, we set up kind of a mutually beneficial situation where we could throw all of our production load. Uh, actually, Kenneth would wake up on Saturday morning and do this, but we would uh, throw all of our production load at various storage arrays, and, and we would measure and kind of work with the, the vendors and providers to kind of do learning on all sides. Uh, we tested a number of arrays, a flash-based shared array that other customers also ran on. Uh, it was very fast in terms of performance, but uh, we overloaded it pretty easily. We tested a larger spinning drive array that was uh, pretty stable at scale, but it's a little slow performance. Um, it was still susceptible to graceful degradation under, under our high, higher load. Um, we also tested a dedicated flash uh, without other customers at Max Stadium, and it was, uh, it was still fast, but we, just, we were able to overload that as well. Um, we finally moved to a spinning drive uh, array with a DRAM cache, which was really fast, uh, but you know, somehow we still overloaded that. Um, so we took the DRAM cache uh, spinning drive array and we sharded it into multiple data stores with the help of Max Stadium, and uh, that eventually uh, got us going. So um, Our virtual networks are organized around large allocation pools, and they didn't really require much maintenance. Uh, we have three VLANs, two of which are production, and one is sort of for expansion. Uh, the networks use DHCP, so every time a VM is booted on, on demand, it gets provisioned with a DHCP address, uh, comes on the network very quickly. There's an additional management network, which all the physical hosts live on, as well as some other administrative services, like an HTTP cache that is uh, built on non-Mac OS hardware. And for each VM type, which is an operating system and Xcode version combo, we utilize a base VM template. A VM template is released on a regular cadence using a tool called Packer that some of you may have heard of. And any hotfix changes are applied to the VM template using configuration management. We generate a DMG. Well, obviously, it sounds like we'll have to figure out all this out again uh, very soon. We'll generate a DMG from the desired base operating system's major version and use that uh, for a Packer build that results in a base VM file. Uh, if you're not familiar with Packer, it's a free tool built by HashiCorp for creating golden images from a single source configuration. Uh, once that base VM is built using Packer, we provision that template with Puppet to add the various dependencies our environments need for their workflows. Uh, and we also check it into a monkey server to download any remaining packages that might be needed. Uh, for us, we depend on Puppet mainly to configure the operating system settings, install some dependent libraries for iOS workflows uh, via like Homebrew or RubyGems. Uh, we use Hira to manage configuration data, and that's very important to us because we run five different Jenkins master servers, and uh, we need Versailles to be able to point those VMs to the right place using some of that configuration. Uh, these are some of the pieces that are more specific to mobile and to our environment. We use the full, 12, or the full, full spec 12 core Mac Pros with 64 gigs of RAM provided by Mac Stadium. Uh, we enable hardware assisted virtualization in the VMs to support iOS simulator functions and performance. For many different reasons, we support a wide range of vCPU and memory settings for the, for the developers we, that use the system. Um, some are based on use case, some are based on requests for specific testing. Uh, one of the most important things about using a virtual environment for software development and testing is the use of linked clones. Uh, at least we've found that to be important. And uh, the idea of having kind of a clean room environment for software testing is obviously important, as we've, as we've mentioned. And linked clones allow us to provision a really low cost clone. Uh, from the base VM template so that our infrastructure can continue to run efficiently. And that base VM template uh, doesn't incur any of the changes from whatever workflow gets executed in that clone. We had a number of deadlines to hit with regard to the uh, product development goals of our teams. And since done is often better than perfect, uh, as we just heard from uh, Pepin. And I was the only engineer on the team. I did what any lonely engineer would do and created a bunch of tech debt for everybody else that came after me to deal with. Um, thank you. Notable items include using OS 10 server's DHCP service to run an entire cluster of thousands of VMs, uh, and hacking together a Jenkins plugin dependency to launch VMs using a single build button that all three of us would end up clicking about tens of thousands of times over the course of the next quarter. Uh, shame indeed. Um, but luckily, I was not alone for long, and our clicks of that build button were soon forgotten. Our worker provisioning service, Versailles, was here to save the day, and Olivier is going to give us some details about that. So, uh, Versailles, why did we uh, build Versailles? So, we needed a system that could basically spin up uh, VM, or more, more generally uh, Jenkins uh, workers, as fast as possible, uh, and as fast as the infrastructure could uh, handle. 
This will in turn provide resources for the CI build and test jobs. Uh, the system should be able to dyna dynamically increase and decrease the pool of workers based on the CI load. As Nick mentioned, we wanted, sorry, we wanted a clean and a reproducible build environment. So that means having a fresh uh, macOS virtual machine for every build and test job. Uh, historically, uh, Xcode and macOS uh, upgrades were mostly a long and manual process. So we wanted Versailles to automate this part and make it as fast as possible. And finally, we wanted to decouple the provisioning process uh, from Jenkins as much as possible, so that would facilitate the development of the CI infrastructure in the long run. So before we started uh, working on this project, we considered other alter alternatives, uh, some open source, some uh, proprietary. We looked at the Jenkins Cloud plugin. Um, it met many of our requirements, but not all of them. Uh, one of them is that it didn't support a GNLP uh, protocol, and since we relied on this to spin up our uh, workers uh, with uh, the, the Jenkins Swamp plugin, that was an issue. Uh, it also did not let us uh, modify the virtual machine metadata. We used this to basically point a virtual machine to a, a Jenkins master server and to point it to a worker pool when we uh, start the VM. So that was another issue. Uh, and as I mentioned before, we wanted something that's not too tightly coupled to Jenkins, and this is a part of the Jenkins plugin, so that was an issue too. We also looked at physical nodes, so using Mac minis or Mac pros instead of virtual machines. Uh, the performance factor was appealing, but it didn't have the same uh, provisioning speed, uh, the same flexibility to grow and shrink uh, workers of pools, and uh, it was a much higher cost for the company. So, and also before I joined uh, Uber, um, Kenneth and, uh, and Nick looked, looked at uh, other third-party uh, toolings, but uh, here again, uh, not the same control on, uh, or flexibility over the pools of workers. So Versailles. Uh, Versailles is uh, a web service that exposes a RESTful API uh, to, to our CI system. Uh, it can manage a pool of workers by provisioning or removing uh, macOS VMs. It also comes with a lightweight CLI that we use for a maintenance task. Uh, Versailles interacts with our cloud provider, Mac Stadium, uh, that is mostly uh, made of the ESX servers, so uh, vSphere 6 ESX servers, and it interacts with, uh, with VMware via the vSphere API. It is written in Go. And we can dynamically change uh, configuration settings like the size of a pool, uh, the type of pool, uh, and all these things. We also built this project with the intent of uh, making it generic enough so we could use other cloud providers like AWS EC2, uh, GCP, DigitalOcean, and others. Uh, so that's why we made every handler uh, written in Go uh, as generic as possible. Uh, so why did we choose uh, Golang for that? Uh, so when we started this project, uh, the company was switching uh, to uh, using uh, mainly Go and Java, which means that all the in-house tooling was going to be developed for these two languages. Um, we also like many of the features that this language provides, um, such as um, compilation times, uh, concurrency with Go routines, and again, all the in-house uh, frameworks that were already developed uh, to help with like monitoring, uh, logging, for example. We used a library called GoVimomi. Uh, it's a pretty active project at the moment. Uh, it's being used by uh, other uh, notable projects, such as Kubernetes and uh, Terraform from Ashikorp. Some other li library exists for uh, Python users, for example. There is PyVMOMI, which is uh, very active too. 
Um, RBV Mommy for Ruby user uh, used to be uh, one of the most active one, but since then uh, it's uh, not been active anymore. I think VMware kind of killed it recently, so not the best. Uh, yeah, so I wanted to show you a sample of what the handler looks like and one of what the backend function uh, looks like too. So here on the left side, uh, you can see the handler, the HTTP handler that receives a HTTP request. Uh, so this is pointing to the provisioner, uh, which is basically uh, the which is. Uh, different for every different cl cloud provider. So uh, if you, you use VMware, uh, you would have an object here, a provisioner uh, object for VMware. That would be a different one from Google Cloud Platform, for example. And then whenever a user or Jenkins, for example, talk to this uh, URI here uh, using uh, one of the HTTP methods such as post, get, or delete, uh, it would uh, perform uh, the, this operation on VMs uh, on the back end. And so this handler function is backed by uh, a function called clone VMs here. What this function does is that it creates a clone spec, so all the specification that you need uh, to uh, clone um, uh, a virtual machine, such as uh, the name of the base, the name uh, whether you want to power, power this VM once you provision it, uh, what kind of snapshot do you want to use to, to uh, clone it from. And then it calls the clone operation from the vSphere API. So, pretty simple. Uh, here is a broader overview of what it looks like, uh, what Versailles, where Versailles sits in the rest of the infrastructure. So uh, you, uh, we, as you can see, um, we have uh, Jenkins uh, that sends HTTP requests to Versailles. Uh, these requests are sent from Jenkins' job that run periodically. Uh, so all operations are logged and uh, monitored by uh, in-house tooling on the left there. We also have uh, an in-house distributed key value store that we use to dynamically uh, change properties of our site, like increasing the size of the worker pool, uh, adding a new worker pool, deleting a worker pool, for example. And finally, Versailles uh, uses, uh, or more, more specifically, Govimomi translate uh, the cloning operation into SOAP requests that are sent to the vSphere API. And then behind the scene, uh, uh, the VMware infrastructure provision actual VMs. Virtual machines. So that's uh, just a, a quick example of the CLI that we can use, like to perform a quick maintenance task, like provisioning a, a bunch of VMs, for example. So uh, Versailles, Versailles significantly decreased uh, the time we need to upgrade a new base. Uh, it also reduced the probability of uh, human errors. Uh, it improved our reactivity to the, the job queue of Jenkins growing and shrinking. It also supports the principle of uh, immutable architecture, which means whenever you instance change something, you never change it. Instead, you replace it with another instance. But I also wanted to mention some of the shortcomings that we faced. Um, a virtual infrastructure has many benefits, but there is some performance concern. Uh, it's not the same, so it doesn't perform as well as physical node. Uh, because of that, uh, that made some people unhappy, and we had to like provide some uh, performance statistics to show uh, exactly how VM would perform, com would perform compared to uh, physical nodes. And finally, building a good autoscaler is hard. Um, Moving, uh, monitoring the, the job queue on Jenkins uh, is not the best indicator of contention on the system. Um, the auto the auto scaling logic had to be spread across uh, Jenkins scripts, Groovy scripts, and also a Go code in Versailles. So, not very ideal. Uh, I'm now going to let Kenneth talk about uh, some of the some of the things that we learned setting up this infrastructure. Hey, uh, 
<clears throat> so yeah, uh, uh, we've hinted on some of the problems we ran into already. So um, one of the main areas we tried to tackle was getting the builds uh, as fast as possible. So our most complex apps at Uber um, can take over an hour to compile in some situations on a slower system. So our developers just bang their heads. And uh, we want to do anything we can to save our developers some time. Uh, so here's some of the improvements we made um, in the system. So we kept a local Git mirror for that monorepo we were talk talking about um, on the template VM's file system to avoid a network bottleneck when the jobs actually ran. Uh, because the repo is so large, so we wouldn't have a whole bunch of servers, re uh, build hosts reaching out to our Git server at the same time when you know 30 builds were triggered at the same time. Um, then, uh, as Nick mentioned, the build tool we use, Facebook's Buck, it aggressively caches build artifacts on the local disk, so future builds don't have to rebuild what uh, stuff that hasn't changed. Um, and Buck even supports a network-based version of that same cache. And then Uber, uh, link up here, Uber open source our um, implementation of that. Um, and then uh, we also try to provision the build machines ahead of need. So a lot of people like spin up build hosts when they run their CI jobs, if you know, they're using AWS or even in, in a VM or thing like this. But we wanted to get it faster, so we would have like we would warm ahead of what was going on, you know, clone five more than what's needed right now, and all that kind of stuff. Uh, so reliability, of course, was a big deal too. Um, so I won't go into a lot of detail on this, but uh, we set up our pools to sort of gradually kill off, actually, essentially random hosts, and then just add new ones. So whenever we made like a minor change to our base VM template, um, we would actually incidentally get a canary for it uh, and find out if anything was broken. Um, and then whenever a node couldn't connect to Jenkins, we would just kill it off, which is really nice compared to the physical side where you probably have to go fix it. Um, and you know we know our base VM template is always going to work. We just clone a new one. Uh, then uh, on the same note, like people could basically self-service off of that. Like if someone was like, "Oh, my job failed on this host," then we'll say, "Just take it offline. It'll get replaced automatically. Don't worry about it." Um, so the same thing kind of translated to alerting. We wanted to make sure that we didn't uh, care about a single node going down ever, but we still would get the aggregate statistics um, and say, like, oh, if builds are failing on all of our hosts, suddenly maybe there's like a problem with our Git server or something else like that. Um, and then load testing, and this is Olivier kind of hinted on this. Uh, we had to figure out how to test each individual component of the system. Uh, and it's like Nick talked about, we had uh, data store performance concerns in the VMware section. And we really had to like break down how do we test that, and then how do we like not have a bottleneck where we it's like on an individual host where a whole bunch of the machines are living. Um, so yeah, uh, it gets a little more complicated with this. Uh, and then also we had to expand our capacity quite a lot while we were building it. So um, we would just kind of look at our weekly peak loads and then figure out when we had to order more ESX hosts ahead of time from Max Stadium. Um, and yeah, Nick mentioned we started with like 35. It's more than 100 now, um, uh, probably <laughs> pretty significantly. Yeah. Uh, so, cost, of course, was like the big thing that the managers and everyone wanted to know about. Um, so, if any of you are like interested in setting up a system like this, you probably got to consider all the kind of different types of costs that come into it. Um, engineering time for your own team, like if you're not already familiar with these technologies, you're probably going to have to spend a decent chunk of time learning them and setting them up. Uh, and then you also want to like account for the time that your developers will gain by being served from a system that has these more reproducible environments than if you have individual hosts that might have you know, one-off problems. Um, if you already have a system that you're running off, like, like us, we had a racks of Mac minis, uh, you got to account for like the time it takes to actually plan a migration off of that. Like we still have you know, some legacy cases where someone, you know, is still using the minis because we just couldn't get them to, like, test out the virtual stuff properly. Just a few corner cases, but, um, yeah. Uh, and then, of course, the actual cost is a big deal. Um, and then you might even have, like, managers or directors or anyone else who just says, oh, virtualization's crap, or, you know, uh, bare metal is crap, and we should all go virtual, you know. So that's always going to play in, but if you can come up with really concrete data, like estimate hours and stuff of engineering time, that can help make your case a lot. Um, so it was just like a kind of like good and bad sides of it for us. I mean, it turned out pretty well for us. I mean, we, like the, the good definitely outweighed the bad in our case. Um, so like 
It's really easy to clean up. Uh, we could make updates on our base VM template, and then it's like super easy to release to the fleet. So like Nick said, you know, we upgrade Xcode on our base template and just release it to the fleet when we want to upgrade our Xcode. There's no like waiting for installs or anything like that. Um, uh, let's see. We oh yeah, so managing the worker count. So like uh, Olivia was saying, we would have. Um, or Nick said we have five different Jenkins masters. We had to like say be able to take you know 50 from this one and suddenly put 50 more on this other one based on the load of the jobs coming into each one. Um, and virtualization definitely made that a lot easier because um, we could use that metadata from uh, VMware's configuration files to uh, uh, pass it through. Um, and I'll show an example of that in a sec. Um, so on the kind of difficult side, it mostly came down to sort of the complexity of the systems in total, so having to know a whole bunch of different pieces, and then also uh, benchmarking things effectively. Like, we couldn't just take one VM and say, oh, this ran in this amount of time, so it's good. Uh, you know, we would have to say, like, when we have 50 VMs running in this part of this, uh, our environment, and then, you know, 100 running doing this other thing, it, then the system will behave this way. So we had to kind of model that out and uh, figure out how to tell people how it was going to perform. Uh, so yeah, uh, this is a quick example of how we were getting information through to the guest OS in the, in the VM. So um, VMware Tools has this cool little hook where if you prefix any configuration thing with guest info dot, um, you can just have arbitrary data that is readable through, you like query VMware Tools uh, in the guest OS. Um, and it's fortunately one of the few things that is supported in VMware Tools on Mac OS. Uh, and so that was great for us. We could say, you connect to this Jenkins master, pass it through, and then just start the Jenkins swarm client with that argument. Uh, it was used for VM name, for Jenkins master, for what labels it should have in Jenkins. Uh, we even did it for things like pointing to a, an Uber data center for, for it should connect to. So um, yeah. Uh, and then lastly, there's uh, probably some stuff you want to run on non-Apple hardware that still might need to be in the same network segment. So if you're using a provider like Mac Stadium, it becomes especially important to um, you know, consider that you're going to have to administer some other stuff. So these are a few examples, DHCP, DNS. Um, we had our build cache server, and some people run things like Artifactory or another uh, system like that. Um, package server like Monkey, you probably want it close enough that your VMs can grab packages pretty quickly. Um, and then you monitoring alerting, you got to have something on the same network for that, too. And yeah, that about wraps it up, I think. Can you everybody hear me? Um, yeah, so any questions? Or uh, you can also reach out to me. I'm at Loyalty Arm on Twitter, GitHub, and a bunch of other places, or in Mac Admin Slack. We try, we try to talk with uh, various people in the mobile DevOps channel about this kind of stuff. Um, but yeah. Thank you.